All right, well, again, thank you for, for this opportunity to have a conversation about lung transplant. And I, I think based on what I understood, it would be nice to start with uh, a case. I am a faculty at University of Pittsburgh and medical director of lung transplant at UPMC. And we actually receive and collaborate with a lot of patients from West Virginia, WVU, and all the other programs actually in West Virginia. So uh, again, thank you for the invitation. So I'm going to start with a quick case, to kind of to illustrate the importance of what we're going to talk about, which is, you know, the challenges in lung transplant with the new, with the current system of allocation. So this is a 64-year-old a gentleman who has interstitial lung disease, followed in the ILD clinic for about 16 years, is relatively stable until 2006 when he started having some worsening symptoms and was started on prednisone and mycophenolate. He was given oxygen on, like, with activity. And since then, he was stable in the, until the last of a couple of years. Uh, he started having some worsening dyspnea and hypoxia. In addition, he had some exertional lightheadedness and leg edema. And he had multiple admissions. One of them was diagnosed with a, a PE, was started on uh, anticoagulation, also was given a course of prednisone that was weaned down. So stable, a little worsening over time, and then a lot worsening lately. He was diagnosed in December last year with PAH group 3, was tried on inhaled uh, pulmonary vas vasodilator, and then that was stopped about a, two months later because he didn't improve. It should be February 2024, by the way. And he um, had to be stopped because of hypoxia and hypotension. So it didn't help, actually made things worse. So he was... Uh, rituximab was added because of worsening symptoms. He was losing weight because of poor appetite and hypoxia with eating. He was experiencing episodic hypoxia uh, with thus, despite oxygen supplementation 24-7. So he was referred to lung test. He was supposed to be seen um, early in October, but he had different plans. In September, September 9, I believe, he went to the ED. Uh, with worsening hypoxia, with straight admitted to ICU, worsening hypoxia, the CT showed worsening ground glass opacities, underlying fibrosis, was still given any microbials and Lasix. His oxygen requirement went up to 15 liters, and soon enough, it was on non reader mask, requiring two sources of oxygen to maintain saturation with, with talking. An echo was done initially that showed severe PAH, so his pulmonary hypertension was much worse, mean, mean pressure estimated around 90, his R right, right ventricle was dilated and dysfunctional. Uh, so we decided to start to work up since he was about to be seen in clinic anyway. So to stabilize him, to take him to the cath lab, we had to put him on ECMO. Uh, VV ECMO was not enough. We had to put him on VAV ECMO so, um, to stabilize him. He went to the cath lab and he had a, he had a normal coronary angiogram. So that was good. Um, so from there, uh, we... We measured his right side of the pressures as well, and they were also uh, very high. So he was placed on the list uh, after completing his workup. And that first morning he was placed on the list. We had four offers. We picked the best one, and we did a transplant using the same VA, well, v, VA, V ECMO configuration. He developed some primary graft dysfunction, stayed on ECMO for about five days. His RV recovered, his hemodynamics recovered. He had a little bit of AKI that required renal replacement therapy. He was taken off ECMO uh, five days later. He made a recovery. His allograft function is optimal. He's on room air. He had some post-transplant vasoplegia for a while. He had some AKI, but all of that recovered slowly. So a tight scenario, almost lost the patient in the process, but nevertheless, we made him, we pushed him through the transplant and he's doing well so far. So here's what's going on nationally. As you can see, uh, more patients are added to the transplant list at an increasing number. We had a little dip in 2020 with the pandemic, but now it's increasing in year over year, about 10% increased number of patients added to the transplant list nationally. And that correspond also to an increasing volume of transplants nationally, about 8 9% increasing uh, year to year. Um, what happened in 2023, a big change was that the allocation system was changed. So we used to have an LAS system, was changed to CAS. And we're gonna talk a little bit about this. In 2023, about 3,000 transplants were done. However, a significant number of patients continue to either get too sick or die on the list, 26%. That's a very high number. 
and lung utilization rate continues to be low. So lung utilization rate is the number of lungs used per donors. So obviously we have the lowest utilization rate because of the nature of how people die and how people aspirate and lung being the most vulnerable during the donation process. Um, so despite all of this, we continue to do more transplant nationally and the need is increasing. So this just to put it in perspective a little bit, this is by 2022 number of transplants that were done, 2,700 or so. People on the list waiting, about 4,300, so you can see the discrepancy. And then weightless mortality continued to be high, almost 20%, 18.8%. So we have a lot of work to do here to optimize utilization and allocation. And when we talk about patient selection, we don't really talk about just selection. It's more like selection and optimization for recipients as well as donors because of the so limited resource that we're working with in terms of organs, we are literally bottleneck in terms of donors, donor quality, donor availability that we have to optimize and maximize utilization for the best of outcomes. So when we talk about outcomes, this is the current data in terms of survival, about 6.2 median survival after lung transplant. So 6.2 is not, is not great. It's a little bit better than before. It used to be about five, now 6.2, but still very low compared to other organs. And you can see there's a significant loss of survival in the first year. So there's another metric that we use, which is conditional one-year survival. So if patients survive to one year, how long do they have after that? And then the median will be about 8.3 years. So, you know, 50%, 8.3 year if they survive the first year. Not too bad. And it's not the same whether you do a single or double lung transplant. Obviously, people get a double lung transplant usually live longer, but this is a, a biased set of data because you know those who got a single lung transplant tend to be sicker. They can't tolerate longer surgery. They have comorbidities, so there's a component of selection bias that makes them live less. But if you think about it, if somebody has severe IPF and they're worsening and they get a lung transplant in the four years, that's probably a lot more than the few months they would have left. Uh, without a transplant. So it's still a significant advantage, but a double lung transplant will give you a longer survival if you can handle lung surgery uh, like this. So these are the most common indications in North America that set in the middle. So you have Europe on the left, others on the right, and in the middle we have North America. And you can see COPD is decreasing in numbers. Alphona and trypsin also decreasing in numbers. Cystic fibrosis decreasing in numbers actually much less even than that. But then you see the ILD IPF population is increasing in number. So the majority of transplants done actually now are of an IPF ILD component versus COPD. So this is going to come into uh, focus in a little bit. So again, we talked about outcomes and mortalities, and this is the one year uh, predictors. So these are the categorical variables that would give you will predict increased mortality. And you can see any retransplant besides COPD. Any transplant that is not COPD, mostly IPF, carries a higher mortality at one year. If they're hospitalized or on the vent, they carry a higher mortality in an IPF patient. So we try to do everything outpatient because once they're hospitalized and then they're on the vent specifically, they're much sicker, and that carries you know 37 or 44 percent increase one year mortality. So that's a big problem. Like the patient we just had who survived and did fine, but that's not a scenario that we like to have all the time. The continuous variable of factors that predict also the one-year mortality, you know, the older the patient, if they have heart failure, if they have kidney failure, if they have increasing bilirubin, so liver issues, if they have higher BMI, also predict uh, one-year uh, survival. About five years, you can see similar factors, right? Age, BMI, recipients, GFR, and ischemic time for the farther we travel for, for organs. And these are the categorical variables for five years. So up to five years, we continue to have that issue if they're hospitalized at the time, if they are CMD mismatch and a single blood transplant. And ILD as well carries a higher five-year mortality. This is up to 10 years. And you can see if they're on the vent or on ECMO, also shorten their survival. So we prefer to have patients listed before they get this sick, before they get to being hospitalized on the vent on or, or on ECMO to get them the best of outcome. And, you know, these outcomes vary with indications, right? So if you have cystic fibrosis, your median survival is about 10 years. That's that top kind of purplish line. 
But if you have pulmonary fibrosis or COPD, it's less. So these bottom two curves, you know, they're older patients they have other comorbidities. Um, you know, IPF patients tend to have more coronary disease. COPD patients have other diseases related to smoking and chronic lung disease. So those tend to have a shorter survival. So if you think about it, an IPF patient who's older, their median survival would be probably less than five years. And this comes in, uh, becomes more relevant when we talk about the new allocation system. So this is the old allocation system that was put in place in about 2004 up to 2023. In this system, the two factors that were taken into account were the one year chance of surviving without a transplant weighed two to one against chance of surviving one year post transplant. So you can see if people are sick, hospitalized, they're, they're higher, Rate, you know, they have a high chance of survival of dying without a transplant, they will be given a high priority to go on top of the list. And then with that, there were also geographic distribution that were taken into account. So transplantation was mostly local. So all the donors from Indiana, for example, stayed in Indiana. Most of the donors from West, West Pennsylvania stayed at EPMC in that old system. Now the new system, which is CAS, there is no geographic distribution. And the one-year survival was weighed equally against five-year survival. Remember, five-year survival is not very common in older people who have, let's say, IPF. So therefore, IPF patients who are older were not as favored. So these are the components that go into the new allocation system. Again, expected one-year um, survival or or the opposite of that would be one year wait list mortality. So if you were dying, were you put on the list today, if you did not get a transplant in the first year, what's the chance of you dying without a transplant? So the sicker you are, the higher that chance. So that gives you a higher points. And then against which you have the five year potential survival. So what's the chance of surviving five years after the transplant? So again, remember if you're hospitalized, you're on the vent, you're older, you have IPF, those chances are lower. So these are less favored. And then there are points given for blood types since O is a universal donor, for example, and AB is a universal recipient. Some points are given to account for that. If you have antibodies, if you're too short or too tall, some points are given so you're not excluded. Pediatrics as well. And if you're a prior uh, organ donor, you're given extra points. So this is actually the table that we use to calculate this. That one year survival, they have maximum five, 25 points, five years survival post transplant, 25 points, and they're weighed equally. In the past, the LAS system, we had one year survival weighed two to one against one year survival post transplant. So you can see the difference. It's a major shift in the way of allocation and priority. And when you look at all the numbers, you can see if you move to the right, you're given a higher priority. If you move to the left, you're given a lower priority. COPD patients were moved up to the right and given a better priority. Patients with IPF and ILD were moved towards the left with less priority, especially if they're older. So an older IPF patient was given a little less of priority than a COPD patient in this current system. And this is the one year follow up after the after the, the implementation of the new allocation system. And th there are categories, we use these uh, alphabets, A is COPD, B is IPF, cystic fibrosis and neurologic lung disease, and D would be the IPF IOD. And as you can see here, the number of transplants done were increased for all these categories, except for the IPF. IPF kind of stayed the same, but COPD went up. Uh, pulmonary fibrosis, pulmonary hypertension, cystic fibrosis, all these were given a higher preference. Uh, same thing for time, wait time. So the wait time for all these categories went down from pre is blue, so that's that's in the LAS system, and green is the CAS system. So you can see all of them, the wait time went down, except for IPF patients, the wait time did not change, uh, stayed high. And the travel distance also increased for all these categories. So now we have to travel farther and longer distances uh, to get organs, which makes it more expensive uh, to get a transplant. Uh, patients were getting more transplants. So um, you can see here, um, likelihood of dying or, or getting too sick on the list decreased in IPF patients. So we had some, uh, some benefit from that. We had to apply for more applications 
to give patients higher priority exception applications in their IPF patients because we, the community thought this was not very fair for IPF patients. So with the new system, there were more application and more requests to increase the points for IPF patients. And so this is the dynamic of transplant. So you get a referral and it's reviewed and we decide whether we're gonna proceed or not with the priority, we proceed with most of them. And then they go through the evaluation and a decision has to be made. We either list them, not very common because most patients need some optimization or we deny, which is also not very common. But the biggest prior, biggest category is a category that needs more work. We call that deferred. So they need more testing or coroscopy, they need pap smear mammogram, they need vaccines, they, they, we found they have coronary disease, we need to stents and wait three months, they have, uh, you know, they need more physical therapy, they need to lose weight, so that, that's a deferred category. And there is a delay here between this phase and this phase, and that takes also a lot of time, mostly in people who have comorbidities, and that delays everything. And then they get on the list and they get transplanted. Once they're on the list of transplant, that's a short time usually. So because of these delays, we advocate for early referral, specifically for people who have pulmonary fibrosis or ILD. Because again, time to complete testing, time to complete vaccination that are required or treat all the extra pulmonary issues. If they have coronary disease, they need stenting and you know, dual antiplatelet therapy for three to six months, that's time we cannot bypass. We have to make sure the stent is stable, is endothelialized before we do surgery. They need to lose weight, that takes time. If you add to this the fact that ILD and IPF are unpredictable, the course could be unpredictable. Today they're stable, tomorrow they, they drop and they get worse, and then we lost the whole chance. And then if we if we look at them early on, especially with the IPF patients, they have we have time to put them through rehab because they have enough lung function to allow them to do rehab and get stronger. So why do we talk so much about rehab? Because frailty is very common in our patient population. If you look at patients who have chronic lung disease, a, a great proportion of them have frailty. Well, they're frail because they have no limit, they have limited lung function. So they're limited in terms of rehab and how much they can exercise. So they become more sedentary, they get frail and more frail. And with that, comes a lower chance of making it to a transplant evaluation or transplant list. So frailty is associated with lower chance of getting a transplant and delay in getting on the transplant list. So that's strike number one. Frail patients, even they go through a transplantation, they have a higher chance of dying post-transplant. So this is frailty measured subjectively. Ask patients, how do they feel? They feel strong, they feel strong or frail. Frail, not frail, you can see there's a significant change in terms of survival post-transplant. And if you measure frailty by testing people, this is using the short physical performance battery testing, you can see that frail patients at the time of transplant had a higher, a much higher risk of mortality at one year, even at four years. So frailty gets you less chance of getting on the list and higher chance of dying after you get a transplant. And we need to spend time on this to optimize it and reverse it. And believe it or not, if you put people through a structured rehab program, their frailty becomes reversible. So we can reverse frailty and maintain that after transplant if we go through a rehab program. And this has been shown in this study, and this is another study that showed if you put patients with chronic lung disease or being considered for transplant through a structured rehab program that takes time, but then they maintain this after transplant because now they have the engine to do it and they're healthier. And you can see they can get back to their healthy levels on all these measures, six minute walk test, sit to stand, gait speed, uh, single length stand on um, left or right. And then the risk of free admission is actually much lower if they go to rehab. So it's very important for us to focus on rehab and frailty, but it takes time. So the paradigm that we, advocate for is not to wait for, to watch the disease progression because it's so unpredictable. It could be fast, could be slow, could be in between. We, we wanna look at those patients, especially those with unpredictable disease progression like ILD patients early on. So we can optimize them. So when they are sick enough, we put them on the list. If we wait for them to be referred when they're sick enough, we may not have the time to test them, optimize them and get them on the list safely with, with good outcomes. 
So these are the national criteria for referral for lung transplant. Um, for ILD patients, or IFAF patients, it's recommended that they refer to lung transplant as soon as the diagnosis is made, especially if they have an FBC less than 80 and a DLCO less than 40%. And if they have any of these signs suggestive of worsening disease, they also should be referred to transplant evaluation. Now, patients with ILD related to other diseases like connective tissue disease, they should be referred earlier because they have a lot of comorbidities. Um, you know, they could have cardiac disease, gastrointestinal disease, all kind of comorbidities that will affect their outcome and that will need to be, you know, treated, addressed, and optimized before they go on the list. Any ILD patient on any amount of oxygen, be it at rest or with activity, also should be recommended for referral and evaluation. So this is the criteria for referral. This criteria for listing in patients with ILD. So you can see, as we said, in early diagnosis, FBC is decreased, worsening symptoms, requiring oxygen at rest or with activity, and if they have any connective tissue disease or inflammatory ILD. They go on the list if they develop only hypertension, if they're having frequent exacerbation, coming to the hospital, they're desatting on oxygen, and they're continuing to worsen. So those patients will need to be on the list, let alone being referred. So if we wait for them to get this worse to refer them, they may be missing the chance to go on the list. So these are the issues that limit with I, limit the, the outcome with ILD. You know, if you have unpredictable disease, you have severe consequences if they get acute exacerbation, they may end up on the vent, they may die. Um, so these things increase the weightless mortality. High prevalence of short telomere, which complicates everything. High prevalence of PAH and advanced disease. Those also would increase their mortality while waiting to go on the list or to get to the list. They have small chest cavity, so shorter people with small chest cavity because of IPF may have to wait longer on the list. So that will also jeopardize them. They may have antibodies and they have a high prevalence of coronary disease. Believe it or not, people with pulmonary fibrosis have a much higher incidence of coronary artery disease than those with COPD. So that becomes an issue that we have to also deal with. And those who have um, who have coronary artery disease will need to be stented, and um, you know that that will you know then we'll have to wait three to six months on antiplatelet therapy before we can put them up you know before we can transplant them, and um, you know that also jeopardize uh, uh, jeopardize their outcome. I'm sorry, I have to answer this text. It has to do with the donor management, believe it or not. So these are some of the issues that complicate things. Again, advanced age, weight, telomere biology, prior thoracic surgery. So we much prefer patients not to have open lung biopsy if they have ILD or IPF because of that complicates the surgical outcome. Limited functional status, frailty and sarcopenia, as I said, higher risk of gastroesophageal disease and esophageal dysmotility in scleroderma patients, coronary disease, as I mentioned, extra pulmonary manifestation, connective tissue disease like GI, renal, cardiac, skin, et cetera. If they're on high-dose corticosteroid, again, if the acute exacerbation acute, and active mechanical dilation, that also increase their, their mortality risk. How about COPD patients? That's a little simpler. So we have time with COPD patients. If their body index is about five to six, if they're having more than one exacerbation a year, if their body index, index is increasing by one point over the last 24 months, um, if they have signs of PAH, they need to be referred. And obviously, if their FEV1 is between 20 and 25%, that's, a, that's an advanced disease that needs to be evaluated. If they're having worsening despite medical therapy, oxygen and rehab, um, and non-invasive elevation as well. If they have poor quality of life despite adequate therapy, and if they're referred for valves and they're not, they're not candidates for valves, they need to be evaluated. With PAH, if they have signs of RV dysfunction, if they're needing injectable therapies, uh, if they're having progressive disease despite medical therapy, if they have hemoptysis or pulmonary aneurysm, uh, they also need to be evaluated. We'll quickly mention the contraindications. There are usually obvious contraindications. Patient doesn't want a transplant. They have a cancer with high risk of recurrence, so it's not five years. Uh, a remission anymore for everybody. Most most of them would be a two years enough. If they have kidney or liver disease, but they're not candidate for dual organ, 
a transplant if they have coronary, if they had a stroke or an MI in the last 30 days, if they have acute liver failure, acute kidney failure, they have septic shock, uncontrolled infection, disseminated TB, HIV, which is not controlled. HIV, which is controlled, actually is not an issue. If they are frail, but we can't rehab them, they have progressive cognitive impairment, and they're not adherent to therapy, they're using substances or smoking actively, uh, those would be absolute contraindication. So again, uh, back to the initial point of early referral. Early referral makes a big deal, improves the outcome actually, uh, because it allows us time to optimize patients um, and, and give them time to address all their extrapulmonary manifestations and other organ diseases, especially in patients with ILD and IPF, and especially with people with other serious comorbidities such as coronary disease that would require uh, immediate attention. I think this is all the slides I have, and I'm more than happy to have a conversation. I think this is the point really here that we're trying to have a more of a conversation and, and question answer uh, with everybody here. All right, thank you, Dr. Hodge. So does anybody have any questions that they would like to ask? So I'll ask a question. So a lot of the allocation or, or a lot of the scores are based on percent predicted values for lung function. And there's this big push right now not to race correct anymore. Uh, uh, what, what's being done with that in the transplant world? Yeah, we, we are not doing the correction anymore, the race correction. Uh, we just put the absolute values and, and the percentages in, in, the, in the effort to, um, you know, we don't want the race correction to create any inequities and in, in distribution. But honestly, I don't think it's, it's a big factor into it because, um, you know, we don't use really the FEV1, we use the FVC, for example, we use the fusing capacity, the actual values. Um, so it is incorporated into the new allocation system uh, and it's not corrected for, for racing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. All right, guys, do we have any more questions? I'm happy to leave my email here in the text if, uh, if people want to reach out. If I type it to me. All right, it's shown there. Thank you. All right, Dr. Hayes, we will not hold you up because um, I'm sure you have a pretty bu busy schedule. So I want to thank you once again for taking the time out today and presenting to our group. Um, if anybody is needing his email, he put it in the chat. It's under Kelly Guthrie, but that's just under mine. Um, so thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. You guys have a great day. You thank as you. well. Bye-bye. All right, everyone, um, if we don't have any further questions, I do want to let you know that our next presentation will be November 18th. Um, we do not currently have somebody scheduled um, to present, so if you would like to, please feel free to reach out um, or we'll get something scheduled. I hope you all enjoyed the presentation today and thank you for joining. Thank you, now.